innovation, all of the countries, this is the word that goes from mouth to mouth, innovation. Everybody's working on innovation today. Organizations, councils, governments, universities. So sometimes, as uh, Mrs. Uh, Mavromataki very well said before, it's uh, not necessary to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from other examples. We can learn from lessons uh, from uh, the whole world. And this is what we will try to do in this uh, next session. Present some cases, uh, some initiatives that some other countries namely in Europe and uh, Southeast Asia, have uh, undertaken so far. And uh, then with, uh, we'll try to discuss these uh, initiatives so that maybe we can learn and repeat something that uh, has happened and has been successful in other areas. Mr. Henry Hassan is here from us, the, uh, from uh, the implementation, Northern Corridor Implementation Authority of Malaysia. And Mr. Paul Maropoulos would be the other presenter, a professor at the Center of Competitiveness uh, Queen's University in Belfast, UK. Mr. Uh, Hassan, Hassan, would you like please to proceed? <clears throat> thank you, Simos. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, GFCC for inviting me to this uh, very beautiful city of Irina, as well as Athens for the first three days. So, uh, my name is Hasri. Uh, I'm actually from the Northern Corridor Economic Region from Malaysia. So I'm very pleased today to share with you uh, some of our experience and examples on how we develop uh, regions uh, in, in Malaysia. Okay, next slide. Okay, as you can see here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a, a snapshot of uh, what the Northern Corridor Economic Region is. So it comprises of four states uh, in the Northern Region of Malaysia with a total land area of about 32,000 square kilometers and a total population about 6.8 uh, million. And we contribute about 16% uh, of total Malaysia's GDP in 2020. So as you can see, uh, the government uh, in 2008 have embarked in the uh, regional, de regional development, regional economic development approach where uh, the government realized that each region within Malaysia is actually unique uh, they have their own uh, value propositions and its own strength. So uh, the, the uh, economic, uh, the, the corridors are actually developed and established to actually harness uh, this uh, strength and advantage and uh, create a more equitable and balanced economic uh, development. So uh, the key functions of uh, the region is to coordinate the performance of uh, activities uh, around uh, the region to promote, stimulate, uh, facilitate, coordinate and undertake economic development and uh, these are to boost economic potential, to address uneven development and to promote equitable growth across the region. Uh, let's talk about the institutions set setup uh, for the uh, economic corridors. So uh, here uh, is an example of our NCIA's uh, governance structure where the Prime Minister himself actually chair uh, the uh, council uh, for uh, NCR. So it actually have uh, members from each of the states, from Perlis, Kedah, uh, Penang and Perak. And we have other two federal ministers, uh, representative from the civil service and also representative from the private sector. So this actually that, that makes uh, our approach in regional economic development unique, where we have a strong support from the government led by the prime minister, as well as support from the private sector. Uh, reflected in the, our governance structure. Next. Okay, this is our development framework. Uh, we did this in response to COVID-19, uh, where actually uh, every country across the globe actually impacted by the COVID-19. So we have tweaked and come up with this framework where our immediate priorities in developing uh, the region is to safeguard income and livelihood, to generate jobs and employment, encourage entrepreneurship, and also to spur the local economy. Uh, and there are a few key economic clusters that will drive growth for the region. Uh, these are manufacturing sector, services tech sector, and also uh, the agriculture sector. These are the three main sectors that uh, will, will create the economic activities and generate growth, uh, jobs, and investments. We are also looking into uh, how to create the key enablers for growth. Uh, these are namely infrastructure, the ecosystem, the skills and talent, and digital, digital and technology. So as you can see here, this is uh, a very comprehensive 
uh, development framework that we have actually adopt in order for us to develop the, the region. Next. And we have set uh, targets for us to achieve by 2025. So these are our targets. As you can see down below, um, we target uh, to, to, have, to achieve a 300 ring, uh, billion ringgit economy. Uh, this translates to about 5 to 6% economic growth for each year. And these are other uh, performance indicators that we have set ourselves, namely uh, increase in household income, uh, in, uh, job creation, cumulative investment, and uh, also creation of new entrepreneurs for the region. Next. Uh, this is our uh, integrated operating model. So for us to achieve the key outcomes of job creation, entrepreneurship, uh, achieving high income, and also increase in private investment, uh, these are the three things that we do. Uh, one, we, uh, we empower the hum our human capital and community ensuring all this economic development have a positive spillover to the community, as well as uh, we implement key strategic projects for the region. This include uh, new industrial parks, uh, strategic infrastructure, and also initiatives to spur R&D uh, in the region. Uh, in the end, we also facilitate private sector investments uh, through uh, pro pro uh, offering of uh, incentive uh, packages and facilitating investments that uh, will come to set up their businesses into the region. Okay, next. These are some of our examples of uh, our, our key initiatives and projects. Okay, <clears throat> uh, here, uh, just an illustration of how we create a, a conducive and comprehensive ecosystem, investment ecosystem uh, in the region. Uh, this is an example of manufacturing. Uh, so in order for the region not, not to compete with each other, which is other so we have identified key clusters and key differentiators for each of these uh, localities within the region to focus on. For example, we have uh, clusters on electronic uh, and uh, electric and electronic medical devices. We have clusters to focus on manufacturing, uh, automotive, aerospace uh, services, uh, global business services, education. Uh, and, and so on. So this is how we actually make, make the, 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 the region complementing each other rather than competing uh, among the localities. Next. And these are some of uh, examples of new industrial parks that uh, projects that we, we are developing, uh, focusing uh, niche areas and high value added sectors. For example, we have uh, the Kedah Rubber City, the uh, Chuping Valley Industrial Area, and also the new Science and Technology Park in Kedah. And uh, we, we, we are also focusing on uh, key sectors and, and uh, clusters that are uh, high, high, high value and high technology uh, in order for us to attract uh, key investments and also create uh, high, uh, high level incomes for, for the region. Okay, next. Uh, <clears throat> other than attracting investments through industrial, uh, industrial parks and industrial areas, so, so we also focus on developing key infrastructure uh, for the region. So I think these are one of the uh, key enablers that attract investments, especially in uh, logistics, in uh, <clears throat> facilitating connectivity, and also mobility uh, within the region. So these are some of the examples of uh, projects that we are developing for example, uh, new uh, seaports, uh, deep seaports, uh, new airports, uh, roads, highways, and, and so on. <clears throat> this is our incentive uh, package. Uh, as mentioned, uh, one of our key mandate and objective is to attract uh, investments into the region. So for, for, for this to happen, um, other than uh, in, infrastructure other than ecosystem and talent that we are developing. We also provide uh, investors a good uh, tax uh, incentive. Yeah? For example, here you can see uh, those uh, they are coming to NCR can enjoy up to 15 years of tax exemption and uh, also uh, other f f facilitation and also uh, duties reduction from the government. And this is also examples of how we uh, address issues on COVID-19 because uh, in the last two years, we have seen a, a bit of a slowdown in certain sectors. So for us to uh, attract investments and also um, 
ensure a swift recovery for some certain sectors. We also have a special incentive package for sectors that are mostly impacted uh, by, the, by the pandemic. So this will offer up to 20 years of uh, income tax exemption and uh, other duties exemption. Okay, last but not least from my presentation today, uh, all this uh, development, investments, uh, new jobs, infrastructure will not uh, be worthwhile if it doesn't actually um, benefit the people that are living there. So I think uh, Roberto mentioned about quality of life. So in, at the end of the day, we want to ensure uh, all people, the 6.8 million people in the northern region of Malaysia can enjoy better quality of life. So this, this will be some of uh, our programs that we, we, we uh, have implemented uh, to transform uh, the hardcore poors, uh, to transform the, the small, medium and micro enterprises, and also to develop skills and talent uh, in the region uh, for us, uh, for them to actually uh, uh, supply to the new industries and also new development that are coming. And uh, I think that's all from my uh, first presentation. So thank you very much. Kastri, thank you very much. I liked very much, uh, first of all, what you said uh, about the Northern Corridor. Mr. Uh, Governor, I believe that uh, something like a Western Corridor here might be useful for the area. Uh, we all know that uh, Western Macedonia is uh, in grave need today to change their uh, growth model. So maybe you should consider taking the initiative and the leadership to uh, collaborate with uh, the neighboring regions and uh, maybe form something bigger here, something that uh, we could call in the future the Western Corridor uh, for this. Now, uh, Mr. Hasri, uh, talked about competitive advantage, which is very important uh, in this area. We don't need to fix everything in the area. We just need to identify what the competitive advantage is in a certain area and uh, try to, to exploit it, and I say it in the better of senses, uh, to exploit what we have and try to promote and build on that. Identify the clusters, not only services here, but maybe manufacturing, agricultural products we do have, and uh, uh, somebody mentions the cheese before, so maybe we can advance and uh, yeah, not only feta but any other cheese. You know, Epirus is famous for its cheeses, so maybe we can uh, create a cluster that, uh, and uh, see what the, uh, the right enablers would be. And of course, in that sense, improve on manufacturing and logistics. And that would be some ideas to, dis to further discuss. Now, please let me turn to Mr. Uh, Maropoulos. Mr. Maropoulos, we are very happy to have you here. What you've done in uh, Belfast, Ireland is truly unique, is an example for here, and we would love to hear what, what happened there. Herman. Oh, there you go. Finally, we have the mic. Um, I'm really delighted I'm here. Uh, Mr. Governor, Mr. Mayor, Deborah, thank you so much for being so welcoming. I learned a lot in Athens, and I'm delighted with what we do here in Ioannina. Really, really exciting stuff. Um, and this is really the nature of global... Can you go to the previous one slide, please? Um, I'm a professor that physically originates from here. I'm from Thessaloniki, and I have been coming many times to Ioannina, enjoying myself, and I'm delighted that you now you, should, you start putting together an infrastructure for innovation, and anything that I can do to support, please count me in. So it's really very, very exciting. Now, uh, a few words about advanced manufacturing in Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland is very industrialized, has been very industrialized, and it has been through a period of tough economic uh, um, circumstances via the troubles, and now it's quite appropriate to physically start again reigniting this capability that exists in Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. So my talk is firstly to introduce you to the Belfast uh, region city deal. Talk about the center we're trying to set up um, in Belfast, the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Center. Um, very important for us is the access to market, who will be the customer of the center, how can the facility be allowing industry to reach the next level of capability and competitiveness, and how can we effectively, exactly as Simo said, how can we create jobs? This center is not mainly for professors, it's for creation of jobs. 
And finally, lessons learned. Next one, please. Okay, um, you see me there standing in front of the field and behind the road, there will be the center in three years time. Um, the British government, the UK government, together with the Northern Ireland executive, put together a package of one billion uh, to create activities leading to innovation and uh, growth and jobs in Northern Ireland. We hope to create uh, opportunities to leverage another one billion from the private sector. So over 10 years, the plan is to create two billion of fundamental activity leading to at least 20,000 jobs, 400 um, million pounds in GVA every year in the Belfast region. Just to give you a sense of the scale of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland is only two million people. So we're talking about two million people. So this investment is likely to have a fantastic acceleration of our innovation potential over the next five to 10 years. And as you see there, apart from innovation, we have visitor attractions, tourism is something that we're sharing with Epiros. We have a lot of tourism attractions in Northern Ireland, and we have a very important agri-tech sector, similar to, to, to Epiros as well. Um, next one, please. So uh, my center then, the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Center, uh, first line, please. It is a partnership between the private sector between government and the universities. And you can see this, unless we have the three elements together, something is missing. Um, we have a, a dual role. The first role is to really support the region, Northern Ireland. And the second role that we have is to identify areas in which we're very, very good, and therefore support the rest of the UK. And I believe any facility of that type has to have this duality. If you simply focus on the region, you don't go deep enough in capability to be able to physically respond and support the rest of the country. Um, we have strong technology legacy. If you go back, Northern Ireland was really a massively industrialized place up to the 40s and 50s. Aerospace industry, shipbuilding industry, you name it, was there in big amounts but the troubles really uh, had massive impact, negative impact on the region. And we're trying to really reconnect with that capability. Um, we have highly collaborative ethos. Setting up an innovation facility, you need to be able to collaborate. You need to open up the arms to collaboration to Deloitte, to banks, uh, to other industries, to other centers. Um, and the scale of the activity, phase one, is 98 million pounds. So that's the phase one of what we plan to, to build. The key objective is really, we aim it very, very high. We try to create capability that will put us on the map globally, not because what we say, but because the customers of ours say so. So effectively, we want to see happy industry, delighted industry with the outcomes of the center to really say, if you want to have the best service in X, Y, and Z, Amic at Belfast does the best quality work. Now, this is Northern Ireland. The dark green area on the right-hand side is the Belfast region that got this two billion of investment. And if you see over there, one third of employment in Northern Ireland is in manufacturing. More than 56% of the outcomes of Northern Ireland, economic outcomes, exports, is via manufacturing. So significant contribution manufacturing makes into the economy in Northern Ireland. But we have some areas that we can improve upon. As you see there, the R&D ratio to GDP is lower than the rest of the UK. We need to address that. And the productivity is lower than the rest of the UK. So therefore, there is some clear things that we need to fix before we can say everything is ready to go. Next one, please. And this is how the value contribution to the UK, to the Republic of Ireland, and to the region of Northern Ireland will be realized via partnerships. Gone are the days where a facility could be established in Thessaloniki, in Athens, here in Epirus, uh, to work in isolation. Unless you have an ecosystem that physically extends geographically and thematically in terms of the sectors of the economy in a meaningful way, you cannot really achieve what you plan to do. So each one of the 
each one of the centers that you see there, I'm sorry, you cannot read it. I'll, I'll make the presentation available to all of you. We have signed a collaboration agreement with all of these centers that you see in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. And the idea is that um, the overall revenue for those things that we're really, really good at in Northern Ireland, we would like to create opportunities and project work and attract industry to Belfast from the rest of the UK. So that's the narrative. And of course, satisfy our industry across the piece. Next one, please. There is three main components. On the left is the factory of the future, 10,500 square meter facility, and you can see really the capability we're trying to build, prototyping, digitization, automation, photonics, and hydrogen. On the right-hand side is another facility focused on composite materials, mainly for aerospace and automotive. And in the center is AMI Campus. Without AMI Campus, this would not work. This is the uh, fundamental pipeline of capability, the university pipeline of R&D to support the innovation. Next one, please. And in the UK, we describe the difference between, if you see the time, uh, if you see the TRL axis, the red axis, TRL stands for technology readiness levels. I'm sorry if it's a term that you're not familiar with, but effectively indicates how mature the idea is. If a TRL is very low, the idea is very, very premature, university territory. If you have TRL of nine, this is application to industry, okay? And you can see that my center, AMIC, is effectively bridging the gap between the university operation on one side and industry on the other. And in the UK, we, we describe this gap because before we created those centers, it was, it was called the value of death. Good ideas created from the university, they had no obvious way to accelerate, no way to prototype and scale to reach the industrial application. And when, because I graduated from Thessaloniki, and I know how many good ideas come from our own laboratories here, the value of death exists in Greece this moment in time. And the more we can do exactly what you do here to bridge the two, to provide an environment so that companies can physically have some support a structured way of support, yeah, in the timeline and in the, in the budget that is understood by business, that is exactly what we need to do to accelerate good ideas going through. Next one, please. So uh, for us, we're focused on industry, and with that, next one, please, I'll give you examples. So this is the sector, uh, this is the sectors in Northern Ireland, Mr. Mayor, and you, you articulated very well what you have here in Epirus and in Ioannina, this is what we have in, um, in Belfast. We have 130 companies in aerospace, defense, and space with 1.9 billion turnover. We have materials handling. Materials handling is excavation, quarrying, big equipment manufacturing, another 1.7 billion of turnover, very mechanical engineering type of products. We have polymers and composites, uh, transport, including marine, is very, very important, and we won some major awards over the last two years. And photonics is building very, very fast indeed. We have a major company called Seagate, and Seagate manufactures 30% of the, of the heads of the drivers of the, of the recording devices of computers are made in Belfast. So it's a significant parameter. On aerospace, do you know that when you travel with, with, with aircraft, 35% of the seats are made in Northern Ireland? So this is some amazing statistics. So therefore, the ecosystem is there. And finally, construction and agri-tech food, food and drink. There is massive opportunities to physically take the best in digitization and automation and apply it into the agri-tech sector in Northern Ireland. And I'm sure the same thing is, is true here. Next one, please. So the themes that we have, listening to what industry wants to say, number one and number seven themes are effectively applicable across every sector in Northern Ireland of the economy and every sector, I think, here in Ioannina. And in the middle, we're really reflecting the specific circumstances of industrial presence in Northern Ireland. Here it will be something different if you were to do it here. Next one, please. And this is really, this is how we start in the journey. Before we start investing in equipment and capability, we ask the question, where do we want to go? And we ask that question of our industry. Where are the gaps? 
So we have concluded a major road mapping exercise, and I will advise you to do the same if you have not already done it um, for, for Epiros, for Ioannina. And you can see that the minister in Northern Ireland and our president, uh, we announced that on the 25th of October this year. Next one, please. And the other important milestone on the same day was to create our industry board. We have 23 CEOs and managing directors of companies in Northern Ireland on our board. So these are the people who physically are driving the innovation and the activities in our center. Next one. And on the left-hand side, you can see the, the lovely green field in Northern Ireland that hopefully will have a lovely building in three years' time. And in October 2025, we would like to invite you to come, and it will be ideal if Deborah and Roberto and uh, the organization come to Belfast and will cut the ribbon, and at the same time, it will be ever so nice if we have you there with us to really celebrate this amazing success and the activities that we're trying to do in Northern Ireland. So, lessons learned then. Um, I thought very hard about it. What have I learned? I'm doing this job for four years now in Belfast, and I have been before in the UK. So what are the lessons learned? That was a really deep question. I thought, well done to Roberto and to, to Deborah for actually posing that question. Um, in my mind, um, you need to really align the innovation to the strengths of the region in order to be successful. You really need to see what it is that you're good at. What, what is your USP? And how is that USP changed over time? That's why I agree with the question earlier about um, uh, jewelry and silverware and everything else and agri-tech and agri-food. Next one, please. Uh, you always need to look at how can your innovation capability bring money into the region by being the best in something nationally or internationally. If you don't do that, you create an ecosystem that hasn't got any gearing to grow. You need to be able to really attract into the region money from outside the region, be it within Greece, be it within Europe. Um, road mapping, I would absolutely, I would strongly advise it. You really need to chart the, the direction of travel by asking the people who actually produce things what are the problems and where they want to go. And next one, please. An absolutely vital thing to have industrial and private sector engagement. That's why I'm delighted to see uh, Mr. Kafatos jointly working with universities. This is really absolutely what Greece lacked in the past. Delighted that we, we have reached that point. Next slide, please. Now, for us, because as you have gathered, it is a little bit um, high tech, the, the operation. It is very expensive, very costly. For every pound you spend on research, aerospace industry needs 11 pounds to industrialize the innovation. So it's very, very expensive business. And key to success is to really make sure that whatever you put your money on, you de-risk it and you bring it to the market in a very timely manner to, make, to, to benefit from the market opportunity. So that's very, very important. And if you ask my opinion as to what is the ingredients for success, you need four things to be successful. The first one is uh, to have advanced and unique know-how. The second thing you need to have is private sector drive and readiness to invest. You need to have leadership from industry. The third thing is to have a provision of a skills pipeline. And when we say skills pipeline, it's not only PhDs or graduates, you need to have people who will operate the equipment in the digitalized factory. So effectively, apprentice training and people who will come out of high schools, but with the right level of skills, absolutely essential for success. And the final thing, you need to have targeted government investment and support. That's why the civic presence in this equation is absolutely vital. Always you'll find, uh, Mr. Governor and Mr. Mayor, that there might be a gap between what the three other ingredients can give you. And then you, you go to the, to the government and say, if I had this support from you, then I could achieve this. And then there is, there is a deal to be had there. Um, so, so if we are successful, if you're successful here, and I wish you all the luck, and I'm sure you will be successful, then you will attract effectively FDI and effectively talent into Epiros. And you will not have negative flow of talent, but you get people coming to you because you're very, very good. And the last one, it is important to place that thing in the context of something that works. 
and I totally agree with my colleague here about infrastructure. Without infrastructure, without productivity at a certain level, without supply chains working properly, without digitization and a level of productivity that you expect to function, I don't think innovation can actually deliver 100% for any region, as, as we're talking about the regional context. Okay, so that's all I had. Next one, please. And <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting, very important. And uh, this might be applicable in a direct sense to the industrial area. However, the whole organization, the philosophy behind it, and the lessons learned, which were very important at the end, are applicable everywhere else. And uh, to build on investment might, uh, I'm not sure, might be, I assume it might be a little high for the region, uh, Mr. Governor, Mr. Mayo. However, uh, I believe that we do have the means to proceed with a plan here and uh, to get some ideas. I will stay in one question because I think that it can drive the conversation that follows. Where do we want to go? And if we have a complete plan to answer this question, I would also comment on uh, the formation of a council in your area or, or a board, however, and I don't mean it, Mr. Mayor, in the Greek sense of a committee. If you want nothing to happen, make a committee. No, I mean a committee that is going to be functional with uh, yourself, the governor participating, the industry, the private sector, the academia, something that will be functional and will direct the whole effort. A leadership board, sort of. Having said that, I would like uh, to turn to you, Mr. Kozumov, and uh, ask what do you think of all this? How do we define where do you want to go or anything else that you might want to, uh, to refer to to follow the conversation? Thank you, Simas. Uh, yes, uh, where we want to go is the crucial question which, uh, which needs to be answered first, in the first place. Uh, as we are mostly deal with the public sector, with the government uh, authorities, both on national and regional level, I would like to share some thoughts about the um, innovation in the state sector, in the uh, governmental uh, sector. Uh, actually, the, the main role of uh, any government is to uh, provide quality of life for citizens and wealth, well-being. Well-being is a part of uh, it is a part of responsibility uh, of a, a business and the government should provide uh, proper, should create proper business and regulatory environment for that. I would not touch that part. I would like to talk about the quality of life and the quality of life, um, at least in, uh, in our country, uh, with the, in our huge country with the low uh, density of the population, the quality of life in uh, in uh, the government is about providing quality government services to people. And uh, our experience is that the efficient and effective uh, government service is a digital service. And uh, there are several key uh, factors which the government, both on national and regional level, should uh, provide. The first one is access to government data, which is collected and stored in many government databases, and infrastructure to access this data. And the, the second main factor is to provide opportunity to businesses, to private businesses, to use this data in order to provide services uh, to the citizens. Uh, I would like to give you two examples. Um, we have a governmental digital platform where all the citizens can uh, get access to 
different uh, government services, which is called eGov platform. Yeah, and before the eGov platform was very was not used by uh, too many uh, people because it was kind of a one source access. After the government gave access to the data, to the government data, to different uh, private businesses. Yesterday, uh, my colleagues mentioned twice Caspi Bank. Caspi Bank is a good example of how the private business can incorporate government services into their ecosystem. This, this helps the government to improve quality of life for citizens, and this helps the business to attract more customers into, into their ecosystem. So, and, um, but this is the national level uh, example. The regional level example, uh, and it is an example of how, to, how the government should uh, provide opportunity to the business to uh, solve quality of life issue by innovation. And, and that example was also uh, made yesterday. It is a video, traffic video recognition system in uh, Astana, in the capital. And uh, it was, it has been possible and it appeared just because the mayor made a decision that this system should be developed by local IT uh, specialists. Not to buy uh, ready-built system and import it into and uh, uh, establish it uh, in, uh, in, in the city, but to create it from scratch and uh, mm, give a chance to local IT company to grow. And this gives their uh, fruits because now this company is uh, scaling up this system, not only in other regions of the country, but also abroad. So uh, my point is the government, actually uh, in our part of the world, with the very significant participation of the government in the economy, both via state-owned companies and via strict regulation. It is, <clears throat> the innovation in the business sector is driven by competition. The, the number one task of the government in that area is to uh, strengthen competition. The other, uh, the other side is which the government should pay more attention today before the competition is kind of a growing, is to focus on, uh, on people. To focus on people, on their quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kana, for this uh, e excellent, excellent comment. Well, I can tell you that uh, the last Global Innovation Summit was held in, uh, in Kazakhstan, and I was very lucky to be there, along with uh, Simeon and Deborah, of course, and the whole team there, and uh, we really uh, were really impressed by the progress, the, uh, the way that, uh, of the people and uh, the prospects of, of, of the region. So congratulations. Obviously, you have set your priorities correctly there, and uh, I believe that uh, what you described, uh, the initiatives from the part of the government, national and regional, uh, is, is a good point to start and make uh, you know, people the central point of our attention. I, I, I agree. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Lanomaimani, your comments? Uh, so, so, so basically, coming back to the topic where uh, basically 
do we need the innovators of Oman to go outside Oman to, to serve somewhere else or basically to bring or, or become in Oman like a, an innovation hub for the region, like the Middle East region? Uh, so there is always like a different point of views in terms of how we are presenting uh, the situation and the position of Oman in terms of innovation and and with the importance that has been driven by the com by the country in regards to moving Oman from basically an economy that is based on oil and gas uh, into an economy that is knowledge based economy and the transition to a knowledge based economy is basically to be driven by innovation to be driven by skills to be driven by all the other aspects uh, of of establishing the fundamentals, establishing first the grounds to establish everything on it. Uh, so in the, in the aspects of different initiatives that has been done in Oman to, to create that transition uh, and to bridge between what happens in the universities and how it is going to be implemented in startups, in companies, in different things. Uh, there was a program uh, that was really directed into converting graduate products graduate projects into startups that are basically into IT, into mechanics, into mechatronics, into different sort of things that moves all the graduate projects into, into startups. And then basically they will test and see what support those sort of projects with different nature of projects, how they are going to serve uh, the economy in a different shape. Uh, so basically, the, the first three phases of that program went from having only graduate projects that were actually on the shelves, on papers, with prototypes, into actually running companies. And one of them has been serving since Oman is basically an oil and gas uh, depending country. One of the projects were actually into monitoring the oil spills that are not only by the Omani uh, sh ships, but also by the export lines, where basically detecting everything. So, so basically, coming to the topic where innovation is is place based or, or basically is is a region based. Uh, usually, when there is a need uh, at every region or, or basically in a specific country, you will see that every country has their own mix, have their own ingredients to to formulate their own innovation system. And basically, uh, in different countries, uh, for example, in terms of Oman, uh, what has been uh, done in the past and all the lessons learned has been gathered currently. And uh, during, or let's say before the end of this year, they will be publishing the first regulation or let's say a full comprehensive regulation in terms of innovation and scientific research that classifies uh, the degree of, of, of freedom, the legislation of how innovation uh, should act in a different manner rather than it is just a business, but basically like how research can be protected, how innovations can be protected, and how they can be globalized, not only localized. So, so the two main visions uh, that Oman has is, is the transition from basically being an oil and gas dependent country or economy into a knowledge-based economy. And the second one is to have a system where innovation is basically given the, the right priority and, and the innovation is driving most of the initiatives in the economy. Thank you very much. Very interesting what you said and I'll keep the way that you finished because it's, I think it applies very well here also. How you can use uh, the uh, innovation to make the transition. And uh, here's exactly what we need to do, I understand, uh, Mayor, Governor, and uh, so we should build, build on that. Uh, please allow to turn to our Greek colleagues here. Mr. Navrozoglu, you are setting up something in uh, Ioannina, in Epirus, something that one would consider that would be better, please allow me to say, uh, be located in Athens. However, you chose Ioannina, you are here. How do you benefit from the region? How did you decide to come here? And the eternal question, where do you want to go? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to, to, to be here. Um, it's a very good question, actually. Um, we at Natec started quite 
early for, for the region, actually, for the technology part of the region. In 2003, we set up the company in Yanina with the uh, purpose to create a technology company, a fintech, what was not known as a fintech at that time. We are creating financial software for banks and smaller financial institutions. We are actually one of the uh, 35 global companies creating software for financial institutions and one of the five companies in Europe um, in the space. And we are mostly focused in, in smaller financial institutions. Actually, what this means is uh, banks that have less than uh, 10 billion of um, uh, assets under management. That's actually typically quite large institutions in Greek terms, but um, on a global scale, they're not that big. So um, the reason that we set up the company in, in Yana was that we are, we're actually based from here, even though I was, I was born outside in the US, but my family raised me here in, in Yana. So um, we, we, we didn't have the chance to, to um, have a, a, a business that actually benefited from, from, from the local, from the local, let's say, uh, things that the, that the area offered. So typically you see in Yana that the majority of the businesses until that time was agricultural, poultry, chicken or water, benefiting from what actually the, 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 uh, the area or the region was able to offer. And uh, because there was not that much of infrastructure, there was not, you know, the road was not the best, let's say, or the, the connection with the airport or the airline was only limited to Athens and in some time in history to Thessaloniki, even though we are less than three hours drive now, uh, you know, you had the, those, those constraints. And uh, we had this persistence and uh, we really wanted actually to make this happen, having this university, the talent of people, all those businesses, but not actually any other similar company in the area. So we said, let's create this, uh, this business. And we had our first client in Yanina, it was the cooperative bank here, and it was client number one, actually. So we, we created a software for them, and um, you know, by going on every peripheral bank, any, any let's say, community bank, to, for other people to understand in the room, who had limited, let's say, um, uh, operation level just to a periphery like a prefecture or something like that. We went one by one every single cooperative bank in Greece and we started servicing them. But what we really understood was that there's a common problem across, across the globe. So every single small bank has similar, let's say, uh, problems. They have lack of resources, they don't have access to capital, and they're really good at something, which is servicing their customers, but they cannot support their back office operations. They cannot really support what is really needed to have their bank up and running. So what we said is, there's a huge market out there and it's technologically underserved, meaning the larger corporations, the larger institutions, do not really want to serve those, those institutions. And we did that. We really did it, we, we, we were doing it quite well. So the challenge was, how do you take this you know, know-how, this, uh, um, this innovation, this technology, this offering, and scale it or put it across multiple different companies and multiple different companies sharing similar characteristics? And this is where, when we said, we have to do something better. And what better means is, can you really offer them something that will alleviate their, you know, their problems on the back office, which is technology, and at the same time offer what they really need is people and access to regulatory and compliance uh, things. And this is when we actually talked to Christos Megalo, and uh, we said, let's form this new digital bank, and uh, we will be offering the, uh, the technology, the systems underneath it, and the know-how, and you as a bank will offer maybe the capital and also the, the know-how from your side. Let's create a new joint venture which we're participating and try to serve those institutions on top of what actually we're doing. There's an additional aspect to that, which is retail banking, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna mingle and talk about that because uh, the meters will talk in, 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 a, in a short while. So, so to the last question, where we want to take this is, 
we starting from Yanina and we have already started. Now we are present in Athens as well and in Germany as well. We are setting up other locations in, uh, in the next year. We, go, we are becoming global. We have some global presence, but it is not there in a scale that would allow us to tackle over 10,000 institutions, which are the institutions that we're approaching at the moment. So um, it, it, it is an ambition and a vision of, 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 of growing, and it's a huge step. And I, I heard some really interesting um, uh, points beforehand. You, you, don't, you cannot really do it by yourself. You have to build an ecosystem. You have to approach other people, not only to, to partner with you, but you know, to, to create, let's say, a, a common, common internet connection scheme where people exchange ideas or you, you exchange resources and actually make it appealing for, for capital, not only financial capital, but human capital to work there. So how do you maintain um, a well-being or how do you maintain uh, uh, talent in, in an area where the majority of the people who, might, who, who, who graduate from the university, they want to go abroad. This is a big challenge. I think we are getting there. I think that the, the, that the, 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 the city actually, actually is creating this momentum where people will migrate or say come back to Yanana and um, utilize or harness their, their mental power. And uh, that's our vision for the area. I think we are in, in the right step, in the right process of, of doing it. And as you said, the future is there. We're trying actually to capture it today. So thank you. Congratulations, first of all, because uh, you brought something innovative to the area before uh, innovation was a buzzword. Uh, I was about to ask uh, how do you benefit from uh, the creation of the hub here and uh, how you can contribute, but of course you partly answered it uh, at the end. If there's anything that you would like to add on the subject, please. Um, yes, I, actually uh, the, the technology hub will be a huge, huge benefit to us because it doesn't really, um, it's not sufficient to just, as I said, work on, on your own, but also you have to create some uh, awareness of what is busy happening in, in, in the area. So how can you create awareness? And if somebody comes for, to work for you, what is an alternative? Let's say that th there's a risk level inherited in their mindset. Let's say that I, I, we uh, try to uh, bring to Yanana the best engineers in the software development. They're, they're, they're on the back of their hands is, what do I do if Natec or the digital bank fails? I have to have alternatives. So what it is there for me to work? What it is there for me to do after I finish my job? There are a lot of things there. So creating a hub and bringing along many minds, bringing together um, people who have common aspirations or have at least some sort of aspirations creates this momentum and this ecosystem, is this interconnection network. And this, this, um, the, the, the new hub that's being created is, is, is a huge benefit. Because let's say um, five or six years ago, you would never think of staying to Yanna if you were in our space. You would definitely say, okay, let's go to Athens, let's go to New York, let's go to, to Frankfurt, Berlin, whatever, where the, the epicenter of, of those things are, it is. So, this is changing now. It is changing and we are really hoping that in the next two to three years, we will be able to bring more talent and this talent will actually propagate their ideas, their, their, their way of thinking, and we actually create, um, we seed something for the, for, the, for the future. So the next generations or the people who are coming like graduating from the university in the next 10 or so years, will have those, um, uh, th those um, let's say, inspirations or th th those new ideas that they can actually follow or improve. And this is something that we definitely want to see. Thank you again, because uh, you hinted at something very important, the improvement also of the social environment. And I believe that uh, somebody mentioned it before, that we should put also people at the center of our attention. Everything, anyway, should be targeted there. Mr. Litsikakis, uh, do you have a similar story? Almost, um, but uh, let, me, let me say also, uh, also a few words. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I've been to many conferences around the world, but I've never been into such an amazing and unique venue. Great choice. Um, so, 
We heard about uh, Ioannina being the Silicon, Silicon Valley of Greece. I don't quite um, agree with this. Why? Because we, we should not try to copy what others are doing. Silicon Valley is unique in the world, and it's unique for a certain reason. Why? Because it created a network effect. This network effect is unique. The moment you start bringing people into your community, then you start to build. You build trust, you build companies, you build culture. This is also very important. Um, you build the economy. And then more people want to, to come and so forth. Um, this is very important when, when it comes to collaboration and uh, being into, um, into a way where you, you build alliances as well. This is, contra, um, this is going not into the way that um, most banks are into the space right now. Most banking sector is very competitive. They are trying to compete with each other, which I completely understand. But what we are trying to do with new this new joint venture is try to build a platform, um, an ecosystem where more partners can connect and uh, create some kind of win-win situation. Um, this network effect is also very important when it comes to opening up into new markets. Um, so yes, we are starting from Ioannina to conquer Greece, but this is just the start. Um, this new joint venture has very specific uh, plan, strategic plan to expand in other European markets uh, across EU, um, allowing ourselves to, to be very extrovert business. And to be honest with you, um, if I go back to the, the communities, we should also think about branding, because business is all about branding, we know that already. But what about the city itself? Does it have a brand name? Greece built its brand name around tourism. Can we change that? What is the next step in, in 2023 for Greece? Is it to capitalize on this remote working, bringing digital nomads to come and work here, enjoying the beautiful sunshine? OK, maybe not today. It's rainy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we have so much amazing things like food, uh, you, you talked about it before, the governor did, and I really feel like home when I, uh, when I arrive in Ioannina. I'm, I come from Alexandrupoli as well, which is a, a city in North Greece. And I, I can tell you from first hand how difficult it can be for local communities where the economy is not going forward. We need to change that. So how about Ioannina bring, uh, building its own brand as an innovation hub? This tech hub, it's an amazing idea. I've seen the, um, the, the building plan and it looks fantastic. So we have to make sure that we, we build this kind of companies like with Deloitte, with Piraeus Bank, with new, this new joint venture, with, new, uh, with Natec. Um, and we should also contribute into that. We are also um, already, sorry, uh, already hiring people to, uh, as we speak in Ioannina. Um, and this is, is going to help the local community. Um, and, and speaking for Snappy, we want to also educate the younger generation. We want to have this new bank focusing on underserved population. We have seen some, you know, some, some of these ladies and gentlemen in the room come from all around the world, in Asia, in Africa, um, where people are unbanked. But here we have a different problem. Yes, everybody can have access to banking, but they're not served well. Why? Because maybe it's very difficult to have access into lending, for example. We, we had very difficult 10 years, the last 10 years in banking in Greece was, okay. I won't even go into, into that uh, story because you know that already. Um, but how about we educate the younger generation how they can um, do responsible lending? Yes, m maybe we, we, we have a lot of students here in Ioannina, for example. What's the first thing you need when you relocate? Uh, you have a new student coming from Thessaloniki to Ioannina. First thing you need to, know, to have is a, is a flat. Second thing you need to have is um, uh, 
uh, is a bank account, right? So for your family to support you in some, uh, some way. How can we support these people when it's the first time they get to have money? How can they spend it in a correct way? How can they get all this education that they need in order to progress into their lives, to their financial lives? Uh, unfortunately, the Greek, I'm not sure about your, the other countries in the room, but in Greece, there is no, uh, no kind of education about money um, in the elementary school, in the high school. And, and then you, you go into uncontrollable spending, which is a mess. So, yes, lending should be there, but it should be responsible. Um, yes, we need to, to, build, um, to build this ecosystem and uh, help Gen Z, Gen Z and Gen Y, which is underserved. And also, I think, the, um, to be more practical, we, we heard about uh, universities, for example. I'll give you a very specific example. How about you come around and you, you, you kind of recruit ambassadors for your brand? Uh, young people are very, very excited about new ideas. The moment you inspire them, you, you sparkle that, uh, that fire, it goes viral as we say, on, online. But it can go offline as well. And this is the network effect that it can change people's lives and it can change the community. So my last message to all of you, it's yes, we start local, but uh, the, the view should always be global. Um, it's not a question. It's, about, uh, it's not about if, it's about when and how soon. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It is a leadership like uh, what you described, the clarity of the vision and the way that you explained it that will drive us all to achieve something better. And here is a challenge for you, and I accept the challenge with you. As soon as we finish with uh, this and the development of the hub here, we go to Alexandropolis and do the same. <laughs> an event in Alexandropolis actually the 26th of February, of February and we are going to discuss all these kind of issues so you are more than welcome to we talk about this. Yes. There we go. And uh, Roberto I believe that uh, we are also in time here. We finished an excellent discussion. I believe that it has been very helpful. I hope Mayo and uh, Mr. Governor for the region also. Better examples, best examples from other, from other areas might be helpful also here to adapt them, of course, to the needs of the region and uh, to adapt to our mentality, to the needs of the people in the area and uh, see how we can improve. Uh, I believe that all of these nice, good people are going to be to, uh, here to assist you on the next day. And we will also love to be here the next day to discuss how and uh, the way and the time within you, what you achieved, your vision, the governor's vision here. Thank you.